Have you ever gone to see a movie that you thought you knew what it was going to be about? Maybe you saw the trailer advertising it or someone told you about it. And so you went to see it thinking maybe it was going to be a comedy and it turned out to be a drama or a documentary or a docudrama. But it was nothing like what you went in expecting to see. And it, you realized as the movie progressed that you were way off in your presumptions that you brought to it. I remember a few years ago picking a movie for Rana and I on a date night, and, and I, I thought maybe it was going to be a drama, although it had, it had uh, Russell Crowe and uh, Hugh Jackman in it, so how drama-y could it be? I thought it was maybe a safe choice. And I realized by the you know, fourth or fifth song, 10 minutes into the movie, it was a musical, and I was way off, way off on the genre that I thought. And this was the remake of the movie Les Miserables. And uh, of course, Rana said, how could you not know this is going to be a musical? Now, to my defense, the, the previous remake was not a musical, and that was my only, uh, intro, my only uh understanding of, of the story of Les Miserables. So, uh, but going into it, I had a set of assumptions about what I was going to see, and it quickly changed. And when we come to any movie or any book, that, that's, that is how it works. We come with a set of beliefs, a set of ideas, of presumptions about uh, what's, what it's going to be about, who the main character is going to be, or what, what the plot's going to be, what genre it fits within, and, all, and that's going to all play a powerful role in how we understand what we're about to read or see. And it's no different when we open scripture and we, we come to the text with, that, with a set of assumptions and beliefs. But when we come to God's word, it's important that we be willing to say, I could be wrong, and I need to be willing to bend myself against the text, against God's word, rather than trying to bend his word to match what I already think or what I prefer. But I need to be willing to submit to God's truth and say, if I am wrong, if my assumptions are wrong that I bring into the text, I'm willing to make that change. As this morning, we were launching a new sermon series on Acts, and we're going to be looking at some, uh, some profiles in Acts, some characters in Acts, and uh, looking at you know, Jesus moving and working in and through his people. Uh, but at the, uh, before we jump into that, I first want to connect this morning's message into what we just did last Sunday. Last Sunday, we concluded our series on building God's kingdom over ours, and we concluded that series by, by actually turning to Acts chapter 2, looking at Pentecost. And so last week's message not only um, concluded the series we had been going through, but it also served as a bridge to lead us into what we're going to be start studying starting today in this series on profiles in Acts. Um, but as we, as we do that, I wanted to, to first start this discussion, this study on Acts, by asking, uh, going back to our, the assumptions we come to uh, the text with, is who is the main character? What is it really about? And a lot of times people have, think that, okay, Acts is it's a, it's, it's about the apostles, it's about the church, it's about giving us this history of the church, it's about... Uh, Peter or Paul, it's about and, and different ideas about the Holy Spirit, it's about you know, different presumptions about what we're reading, what Luke's purpose is, what he has in mind, what he's trying to accomplish. And when we, when we open Acts and, 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 and say, wait a minute, is, is any of that really what Luke is, is, is really interested in and focused in trying to provide for us? And so this morning we're, we're opening this series by asking, who's the main character of Acts? And one of, the, one of the, the candidates that makes a lot of sense that people turn to is maybe this is about Peter. Because 
Luke will spend a lot of time on Peter. The first 12 chapters, Peter takes uh, essentially a central role in the narrative. And so it seems, as a first-time reader, first coming to the book of Acts, you might think, uh, when you're 12 chapters in, that, that this is going to be about Peter. Maybe it's going to be a biography, or maybe, uh, you know, um, in some other way, this is going to be about him or his ministry. But then something, something obscure happens in chapter 12, verse 7. Uh, but before we, uh, we turn there, I first want to just give, I'm sorry, verse 17 of, uh, of chapter 12. Before we come there, I want to just summarize a little bit of, the, of what's going on in chapter 12 so that it will make sense when we, when we come to verse 17. Uh, so King Herod captures and imprisons Peter. But the night before his trial, an angel miraculously breaks Peter out of prison. And then Peter goes to the house of John Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark, where there is a group of followers of Jesus there gathered praying for Peter as he's in prison. And there is this, this humorous contrast between uh, the Peter who just broke out of prison is having trouble getting into this house of friends where he's knocking on the door and, has, and is get, having a hard time getting in. So with, with that, uh, let's actually I'll give a little bit uh, a little bit more of what. So he's knocking on the door and the servant girl, uh, uh, Rade, or trans, uh, transliterated Rada, uh, she comes to the door and hears Peter's voice and so excited that she runs back to tell the believers that Peter is there. And they think that she's lost it. I don't know, she, he can't be there. He's in prison. What are you talking about? Well, she insists that he's there. And so finally they say, okay, well, maybe it's an angel at the door and she's just misunderstanding. So they go and find Peter is there knocking at the door, just as she said. Well, then we come to verse 17 of chapter 12. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison, telling James, the brother of Jesus, and the brothers about this. And he said, excuse me, he said, and then he left for another place. So he, so Peter miraculously breaks out of prison. He, he comes to this house uh, of, of believers who are praying for them, and he tells them to go tell the other brothers who are, have been concerned about me and praying for me, tell them that I am free, and then Peter goes another place. And what in the world does that mean, Peter goes off into another place? Luke isn't interested to tell us. But Peter has been, has been a central figure in the narrative all the way up until this point, and then Peter just goes off in some other place. It's like Peter rides off into the sunset, and then Luke leaves us there, and it's almost frustrating as a reader. Like, you don't, that's not how you write a narrative. You tell us, where does he go? Why is he going? What is he going to do? What happens to Peter? He's not interested in telling us. From there, he actually doesn't even bring Peter back up until chapter 15, the council of uh, the Jerusalem council. And then after that, we don't hear anything else about Peter in Acts. And so it seems early on like Peter, like it's going to be about Peter. Maybe this is going to be a biography of Peter, but clearly Luke isn't really interested in just telling us about Peter. Peter is serving a larger He's playing a role in a much larger story. It's so much more than about Peter. And that's why Luke isn't that concerned to have Peter, this important figure, exit the stage. And the narrative continues on through 28 chapters. And Peter was only, uh, only uh, central in the first 12. So Acts clearly is not really about Peter. And so you might say, well, okay, who else could it be about then if it's not going to be about Peter? And we quickly then turn to, well, maybe it's about Paul, because Paul quickly become, he quickly enters the spotlight in the narrative of, 
of Acts. And in fact, uh, Paul really starting in chapter 13 on through 28. So more than the last half of the book, uh, Paul, it, it follows the, the ministry, the life of Paul and what he does. So it seems like, well, wait a minute, is, uh, is it now going to be about Paul? Uh, which is, is kind of weird from the standpoint of a reader. You're trying to figure this out of, of how do you have a, a changing main character uh, mid-story. But uh, what we will find is that we'll be frustrated when we read it thinking that it's really going to be about Paul because it's also not going to be truly about him. While we get a lot of useful information about Peter, and we'll talk more about Peter in this series, and we get a lot of, of helpful, useful information about Paul and about their ministries, and we'll talk more about Paul, but ultimately he leaves us frustrated at the end of the work. He leaves us hanging with Paul in, under house arrest, with Paul in prison. And as a reader, we want to know, well, what happens to Paul? Why doesn't he give us uh, the, you know, the next step of the story, or why didn't he give us more information about Paul's upbringing, which you would do in a biography? Tell us about his parents. That's what you do in an ancient biography. But Luke isn't focused on filling in all those gaps about Paul, because ultimately the book of Acts is also not about him. When we turn to the very last Two verses of the book, Acts 28, 30 and 31. Luke says, For two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house, where he's under house arrest under Roman guard, and welcomed all who came to see him. He was allowed visitors, welcomed all who came to see him, and then boldly and without hindrance he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus. And so Luke ends, this, ends this, this narrative, he ends this history by pointing us to the preaching of Jesus going unhindered. He's being boldly preached that even though, even while the Apostle Paul is imprisoned, the gospel is not imprisoned, that it continues to expand and it continues to go um, throughout the the ends of the earth, even while the apostles and the leaders of the church are persecuted, and, uh, and it may seem to the world like, like they're losing, but the gospel is not imprisoned, is not stopped, is not slowed down by these challenges. And when we read this in light of how Luke opens up the book of Acts, it begins to make more sense when we turn to we turn to Acts 1 and read his introduction he says in my former book referring to his gospel account in my former book Theophilus I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the holy spirit to the apostles he had chosen after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them for a period of over 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And so Luke opens up by pointing the readers to his first work, the gospel, his gospel account, not because he's giving his resume. You may have heard of me. I'm a big deal. I wrote this best-selling book, Kata Lucan, according to Luke. Uh, but no, he points to this earlier work because he's telling the readers to come to the second volume, the book of Acts, with all that he has written in the gospel in mind. That that's to be the interpretive lens that they look through to read and understand what Luke is doing in the second volume. And what was that first volume all about? Well, he tells you in case you misunderstood it or you don't remember. It was about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Notice it's not about what Jesus taught and what he did. It's what he began to do and he began to teach, which implies that it's not, he's not done teaching. He's not done doing. But that continues to go on without hindrance 
as the gospel of Jesus is being preached, as he, again, he ends his letter, his document on that, on that note. And so what we see is that the second volume is about the continuation of all that Jesus began to do and teach. It continues on from all that he has written in his gospel account about Jesus. So the question then becomes, well, how can it be about Jesus when he ascends into heaven in the ninth verse of the first chapter? There's still 27 and a half chapters left. How can it possibly still be about Jesus? And that's the question that uh, that, that leads us to. Well, Last, uh, last Sunday, we, we looked at and talked about uh, Jesus promising the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and tells his disciples to wait there in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit, and then and prior to his uh, ascension. And we looked at the, that pouring out of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. Well, uh, I... What I want to, for us to see and recognize is that when Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit, when we see that in Acts 2, it is all about Jesus. In Acts 1.8, the verse that Rana opened up our, our service with reading is perhaps the most important verse in all of Acts because everything that comes after Acts 1.8 will serve to illustrate Acts 1.8. It works in the background of the rest of the book. But you, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples prior to his ascension, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That Jesus is telling his disciples that when you receive the, the Holy Spirit, it's going to empower you. Not to better fulfill the law, not to, uh, you know, not to, um, to have more information, but that the Holy Spirit will empower you to be my witnesses, that the pouring out of the Holy Spirit is ultimately going to be about Jesus and empowering his people to effectively witness to who he is and what he has accomplished, what he has done. And that's precisely what we see happen when we turn to Acts 2, that when the Holy Spirit is poured out, we see Peter standing up with the 11 disciples with him and boldly speaking and preaching about Jesus. We'll, we read in 2.22, starting in 2.22, we the Apostle Peter says, full of the Spirit, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to, to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And so notice, so what, is Peter, what does Peter do when he is filled with the Spirit? What is, what is the content of the message that he is, uh, is given and so passionately and effectively gives? It is all centered on who Jesus is, centered on what Jesus alone has accomplished and fulfilled from scriptures, that he is the fulfillment of God's promises. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And that when we see the Holy Spirit falling on God's people, what they do is witness to who Jesus is. And they do the, they, and they're witnessing too, as we looked at last week, he, representatives from all over the ancient Near Eastern world, the Mediterranean world. And so Jesus says, you'll receive power to be my witnesses to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the, of the earth. And that's exactly what we see happen in Acts 2. 
There's another scenario in Acts chapter 3 that it's also, it also powerfully illustrates this. I just want to briefly look at, that, at this this morning. That while Peter and John are going to the temple, they see a man who is, who's been crippled since birth. Who His friends bring him out and lay him in, fr- in front of the, the gate into the, the, camp, the temple courtyard every, every day to beg for money. And, and Peter sees him and, and says, look at us. He hears, he hears him and gets excited thinking that he's going to receive money. So he looks at Peter. And this is what Peter says in chapter 3, starting in verse 6. Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. And he jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went, he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God. And of course, the, the people... In the, the Jews in the, the temple courtyard see this and they recognize the man. This is the guy who they know has been crippled since birth. We pass by him all the time as he's out always every single day outside of the temple begging. And they recognize and see that he's been healed and they're amazed and astonished. And so the, they actually go and start to crowd around Peter and, and John and Then Peter addresses the crowd in verse 12, starting in verse 12. When Peter saw this crowd, saw that they're coming to him, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus and who you handed over to be killed. And you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. They're amazed at this healing. And Peter says, why are you looking at us as if it's by our power, as if it's by our authority that this has been done? You're amazed as you should be. But this was not our power on display. It was in the name of Jesus, by the power and authority of Jesus, that that this man was healed. And so what we see is that even though Jesus has ascended, he didn't ascend into some heavenly retirement home where he no longer works and speaks. It's not as though the book of Acts is the aftermath of, okay, Jesus did his work, now it's the disciples' job, and it's on them. That's not the story of Acts. It's that it continues to be about the work and, and the work and the message and the mission of Jesus that he is accomplishing in and through his people. It is still his power on display. It is still his words being preached. It is still his mission being accomplished. That he continues to move and work and speak. But he doesn't need to be physically present to do it. And so what we come to see is that all of Acts from the beginning to the end is all about Jesus. It is his power on display. It's not that Peter and John and James, and not that the the disciples were just this great group of powerful men. It was Jesus' power on display that he, he used and moved through his followers. 
and poured out His Spirit to empower His people to go about His work. And so from the, for the, the person watching might easily falsely conclude that they were seeing the power of the apostles. But no, as Peter says, why are you looking at us like it was us? It wasn't. It's in the name of Jesus. And when we, when we see that and we recognize that, we start to see that, that throughout Acts, these great miracles and healings, casting out of demons, that all of these displays of power are, the, are, are based on the name of Jesus. They're teaching in his name, preaching in his name, casting out demons in Jesus' name, healing in Jesus' name. They are baptizing in Jesus' name. They're celebrating communion, remembering and celebrating who he is and what he has accomplished on the cross. All that the early church does is centered on Jesus. He is the main character. Not just the main character of Acts, not just the main character of Luke, but of all of Scripture. He is the main character of the early church when they come together. He is at the center of all that they do, of all that they teach. He is at the center of the, of the early church's lives, of the, of the disciples' lives. And today, he remains at the center of his church. When we get together, when we come here every Sunday, it's not about the name of Wintergreen. It's not about the name of any person other than Jesus. We come together and still come together, empowered by his same spirit, to carry out his mission that he has given us. His work, his power, his message, his work. But recognizing he is able to do his work, and he chooses to do his work through his people. And that when we come together, if we truly want to see, desire to see God move in this church, in this community, through this church, it has to be dependent and based on God's power, not ours. And everything that we do as a church needs to be centered on this main character, on Jesus, on what he wants, on his mission. That is the reason why we gather. That is the reason why we're here. And so this morning, I, I want to leave with this question of, okay, so Jesus is the main character of Acts, of Luke, of Scripture, of the early church. But is he the main character of your story, of your life? Is he at the center of what you do and why you do it, of what you pursue, of your time and your energy? Is he at the center of your story? That like, just like the early church, if we will pursue him and put everything in him and rely on him and his power and his spirit, he will do big things in and through this church body. But not because any one of us or the group of us are great, because he is great if we will keep him at the center of all that we do. So this morning, I want to challenge you to, to pause and reflect, is Jesus at the center of my life? Is he the main character of my story? Would you bow with me? Lord, we come before you, and we just thank you and praise you for who you are. Lord, that you are so patient with us when we try to take that center stage or when we try to play other, put other things in your place, but you are so patient and that you desire for us to submit to you, to be used by you, that you could do it all without us, but you call us to be involved and invested and focused and all in on your kingdom and your work. Lord, would you 
move in our lives, as we seek to keep you at the center, would you empower us with your spirit to be faithful, to be effective witnesses of who you are and what you have done? Would you empower this church body, Lord, to have an impact, to witness to who you are to the ends of the earth, to this local community that we're in and far beyond? Lord, we want to be faithful. We want to be a part of what you are doing. We ask that you would move us with your spirit to fully submit and pursue you with everything. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.